Hello everyone, welcome back to the workshop. It's time for another blacksmith question of the day. Let's get right into it, shall we? The first question of the day comes from the Wonder Boy 420. Use the proper hashtag, hashtag blacksmith question of the day. Thank you for that. Hey Roy, I'm new to the hobby. I hear you always talking about mild and hard steel. Is there any easy way to tell the difference? Also, which one is good for what types of applications, like for tools or projects? Thank you in advance. Okay, Wonderboy420, thank you uh, for that question. So the difference between just your standard mild steel or your hardenable type of steels is the carbon content that is within the taken the bar of steel. Now, that ranges wildly depending on what type of steel you're working with, whether it be like a truck leaf spring, a coil spring, or say a jackhammer bit, that carbon content's probably gonna be all over the place. But as a general accepted rule of thumb, that all falls under the high carbon steel or hardenable steel category. So those things you can turn into tools. As where mild steel, and or 1018 or structural steel like A36 or something like that is all going to be on your lower carbon content. So that's what you're gonna turn into projects and things like that. So that is like that is the short that is the short answer for that. As far as applications, tool steels are like the name implies. They're meant for tooling, making punches and things or high wear uh, situations where you need to take and have wear resistance impact resistance or deformation resistance in general and then your mild steels or structural steels are building steels there are things that you make flowers and little florally things out of and they're usually generally a lot softer a good way of testing oh, that i do before i do any other types of tests i'll pick up a random bar of steel go to my anvil i'll give it a whack on the edge of the steel um, just where it's been cut off, I'll just give it a whack right on the corner and just see how much deformation I get out of it with a, just a gentle whack from the hammer, like a lift up and drop. If I get a lot of deformation, I know it's a softer steel. If I'm curious about it, I might do a spark test for it. Um, and, and if it throws off a shower of sparks with a bunch of bursters after it, then it's probably some sort of annealed high carbon steel of some kind. And I'll set that off the side for a future project or until I can have somebody actually check it for me what it is specifically. If you take a hammer on a piece of steel and your hammer rebounds almost right away and it doesn't have that much deformation, definitely spark test it. Chances are it'll have a firecracker early effect, really short sparks that are really explosive like that. And you can, you, you can usually gauge that, that that's a higher carbon piece of steel. What type of carbon content in it? That's something for another day. That's a topic of another day. So thank you for the great question. Uh, I hope that will help you and thank you for being a part of the channel. Next question comes from Soggy Bottom Forge. Hashtag blacksmith question of the day. How much does the length of the handle in your hammer play in the ability to move steel? And what is a good length range for the handles? Thanks again for the great video and keep on keeping on. So let me set this down here real quick, my little phone there that I'm reading my questions off of, and we'll pull up our little demonstration hammer here. Now it is wildly debated on the hammer length. Usually it's whatever you are comfortable with swinging. This could be I mean, almost indefinitely long, as long as there's nothing to hit behind you uh, and it doesn't impede the actual work, hammer work being done, it could be this long if it needed to be, depending on where you're holding the hammer. Uh, that, that doesn't really matter as far as the length of the handle. Now, if you make it too short, obviously, you're gonna be gripping up a lot closer to the head. And as far as what I feel about that is I feel that that is a completely wrong way to forge. That's my personal opinion. I think it's physics and facts when it comes to that. But again, that will get highly debated and you'll probably see those comments down in the comment section down below here. Um, my general length of handle is I like between 14 and 16 inch length handles for anything that I'm doing larger forging work with. Uh, that way I can get that extra leverage on that hammer throw on it. I get that extra whip out of it. Uh, it does require you to stand a little further away from the anvil and it does make you have to sit up straight at the anvil. Some people, you know, 
maybe you know you're getting aged your eyes don't see as well or maybe your anvil's a lot higher because you know you like your work to be up a little closer so you can see it it's at a comfortable viewing range for you you know they'll have a little shorter punchier kind of hammer blow or stroke and therefore they will have a little shorter handles and usually stand a little closer to the anvil so the longer the handle the further away from the anvil you'll have to stand and the better your eyesight will have to be as far as um, in accuracy to get your accuracy there Generally, the accepted length of the handle is usually when you grip the hammer head in the palm of your hand. It should come and just touch. As you can see, this is a little longer. Again, I like longer hammer handles, but generally the thought is that it should be as long as your forearm is here to your elbow, the inside crook of your elbow. That's where that should end up when you hold it in your hammer hand, and you should be able to bend your elbow up like that, and it should be right there in your forearm. That's for that. How much does it affect the actual hammer blow? It will affect the hammer blow if you can swing it accurately at the end of the handle. So if again, if you have a two foot long handle but you're holding it clear up here, it has no effect whatsoever. If you're holding it in the dead center of that two foot handle, again, it's gonna have a little better effect because again, you're getting leverage. You're creating time and potential energy up here before it comes down and hits the piece. You're raising the hammer higher, and so therefore it has a longer distance to travel and it, it can be propelled quicker that way versus a tiny short hammer where it's just however fast you can move your arm. The end out here, kind of like think it the, like the crack of a whip, right? The whip develops its power because of the length and it's coming along and it's like pow, it's that sudden pop at the end. It's not your arm. Your arm doesn't make a whipping and a popping noise just because you go that fast. Again, it develops all of its power right there at the end because of that potential energy that has built up and then it breaks and you know cracks at the end of the thing, breaks the sound barrier even. You're not gonna probably break the sound barrier if you do with your hammer. Um, I want to see it, put it online. Uh, but anyways, so with a, long, with a longer hammer handle, you should be, it should affect quite a bit, again, if you can swing accurately enough. This is something that doesn't get talked about too much in blacksmithing, but I'll go ahead and elaborate a little bit on it now. A lot of blacksmithing is not about brute force or swinging the largest hammer and, and just being this big ape of a guy that can, you know, swing a 50 pound hammer by himself. Has nothing to do with that. If you can swing a 50, a 50 pound hammer and you hit each horn of the anvil and you hit four anvil blows and one hammer blow on the mark, uh, you are wasting energy and you are not going to get a lot of work done because that piece is chilling. The way that we get metal to move efficiently is by being accurate with our hammer blows and going through progressive forging. So being able to progressively forge a bar of steel out in the right hitting order to be able to do that, that is what makes you very efficient. My forging hammer that I personally use is a one and three quarter pound hammer and that is my everyday driver and I can drive that thing just as fast and just as hard as anybody with a three or four pound hammer and I can move metal just as good as anyone. The, the difference is you know, the difference is, is the accuracy. So if you come across a guy who's swinging a four pound hammer and he's swinging it accurately and he's using the length of his hammer handle he's probably gonna win out against that one and three quarter pound hammer. But if he can't swing that thing with the same accuracy that that one and three quarter pound hammer can, it, he's, it, it's, it's, not going to, it, it's not going to pan out as well as far as efficiency is concerned. So again, be focused on accurate forging, not necessarily you know, swinging the biggest hammer or the lightest hammer. Handle length. That'll bring me back to my handle length and then I'll get off the subject. We'll go on to another question. Handle length usually gets shortened up as the weight of the hammer increases, unless you're gonna two hand it like a sledgehammer. And the reason why is because as the weight becomes too much for your wrist to pick back up off the anvil, you start losing accuracy. Because the hammer comes down, it bounces any which way. Your wrist can't take that. And so in order to contradict that, 
you start creeping up the hammer handle. So when you come down and you're hitting your piece, you're controlling the hammer more and its movements. Uh, so having a longer hammer handle on a big old hammer head's probably not gonna work. It's going to end up shortening up. And you'll, you'll start noticing that if you get into forging with rounding hammers and things. A lot of people put short little baby handles on them and grip them way up by the head where this isn't, this is basically useless and it's because it's a six pound hammer and uh, they can't swing it from the end of a 16 inch handle. So uh, again, kind of go with what feels comfortable for you. Uh, my personal preferences is to take and have a 14 to 16 inch long handle. That's the start here to the end here. That's how they measure them. That long of a handle in hickory and I like to swing it from the end of the hammer handle like God intended. That's, how, that's, that's my thoughts on that. Thank you for the great question and uh, let the games commence in the comment section. <laughs> Let's, let's move on to another one. Next question came in from a Jim Talbot. Hashtag question of the day. I realize the benefits of an electric blower, but which do you prefer? Electric or the quieter manual blower? Uh, great question, Jim Talbot. Talbot. I personally appreciate a hand crank blower. I like the control. I've used it, I'm biased. I'm highly biased towards a hand crank blower because it's what I've always used. Here recently, since moving to this shop um, and not having a proper flu out yet and needing to get back to work, I've been burning coke because coke puts off no fumes. It doesn't put off smoke, right? It doesn't put off that classical, you know, blacksmith smoke. So I've been using, uh, you know, my coal forge as a coke forge, and I have been piping in a blower underneath the bottom side of that. So I'm slowly transitioning to using an electric blower, and the most likely what I will be doing with that is I'll be putting an electric blower on a rheostat and an air gate. When it comes down to my preference, I'd rather be able to do the hand crank, but again, I just can't do that right now until I get a good solid, um, you know, smokestack up and out of the thing. And I've also played around just a touch, just a small touch with an old fashioned bellows system. And personally, if I could, I would have a great bellows in here uh, just because, and I may just do that yet because I just think they're cool, they're quiet, there's not a lot of cranking, you know, you just kind of pump them up with the handle and then they just kind of blow at a nice consistent rate and then you crank them up again and then they blow at a nice consistent rate. I really, I really like that effect. It just, I don't know, it kind of connects you to our ancestors and the Smiths that went before us. So that's it for today. Thank you all so much for the blacksmith questions of the day. Comment down in the comment section if you have a question that you want me to answer. Um, again, use the hashtag blacksmith question of the day if you can it highlights it in blue for me so this way i can actually find the questions amongst the sea of questions that we get here at christ center ironworks if you'd like to support what jessica and i do here at christ center ironworks a great way of you doing that is checking out our website over at blacksmithpds.com or you could consider getting yourself some merch we have some new recently redesigned merch in the merch store at Teespring. Uh, again, there'll be a link and there's probably a little Teespring bar just below the video here uh, that you can click on. We greatly appreciate that. Without any further ado, God bless you. Thank you so much for watching and we'll catch you on the next one.